Lord God, Father, with all our getting to get understanding that we are changed on the inside out. Beyond the storm, beyond the trial. Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to our sit-up spiritual impact training using prayer and scripture. I'm Tony Burke Brown. Welcome to my spiritual fitness channel where we come Monday through Friday, hear a word, get the principles so we can apply it to our life. This is all about exercise and godliness, growing, changing, progressing, being impacted by God's word so we can impact the world. So welcome. Get your pen, paper, and your highlighter. Get your Bible, everything that you need in order to take notes. Write down the scriptures. Write down notes. Uh, anything that you need to go back and do your own study so that you can meditate on the word day and night. And so we are going to be hanging out a little bit in the book of Proverbs today. The title of our study today is Your Response. Your Response. We're going to open up in prayer and we're going to go right into the word. We're going to start off in Proverbs 18. Proverbs chapter 18. Heavenly Father, we come today and we just want to say thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to come, Lord God, and study your word, your truth, to come together as believers, to come together to hunger and thirst after you, to seek more of you, to desire more of you. Father, to be nourished by your word, to be filled with your spirit, to be covered in your anointing, to grow in truth, to grow in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that we can operate in your word and everything, obeying your commands, submitted to you, resisting the devil that he flees, that we are walking in spiritual authority, that we are more than conquerors to him that loved us, that we are moving forward, victorious overcomers because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the finished work on the cross, that he is your son, that he died and that he rose from the dead, that we may have life and have it eternal and abundant. So we yield to you now. We ask that your Holy Spirit would teach us, guide us and lead us through this study, that there's no confusion, no distractions, but that we have ears to hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying. And that father, we receive it with gladness, hide it in our heart and meditate on it day and night. And we praise you and honor you in Jesus name. Amen. To God be the glory. So we're starting off in Proverbs chapter 18 and we're looking at verse uh, 13. Proverbs 18 13. Again, the title of this Bible study today is your response or your answer. You know, how we answer, how we respond to people, situations, um, it matters in our walk with God, in our witness to others. Um, and it shows if we are operating in the flesh or in the spirit. Proverbs 18, 13 in the New King James Version says, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. Now, we know that the word tells us in James chapter one about being slow to speak, slow to wrath, it tells us to be swift to hear, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. And so when we take our time and we are thinking carefully about what we're going to say or how we're going to respond to someone we have to take time to listen. This verse of scripture is talking about the one that answers before he hears it. Like, have you ever seen somebody or heard somebody like they're, you know, saying something and then they're cut off immediately and somebody is talking on top of them. Somebody is answering. They don't really know what was being said, what was being conveyed. And so it says in the Amplified, he who answers before he hears the facts. It is folly and shame to him. And folly means foolishness. And so we need to make sure that we are listening, that we hear the facts, that we are swift to hear and slow to speak. Um, the NLT says spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. So what is your response, your reaction, your answer? Do you answer before you listen, before you hear, before you know the facts? It's like on the internet, oftentimes people are posting things. They haven't checked the facts. Um, people are seeing clips of things, pieces of things, haven't seen the whole thing, don't know what it's about, but they're responding, they're reacting. It's foolish and it's shameful. And so now let's look, go back three chapters to Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs 15, we're first going to look in verse one. Proverbs 15, and we're looking at verse one. And it reads, this is a video. Remember, you can always go back. You can pause it. You can go ahead. Proverbs 15 verse 1 says, 
In the New King James Version, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A soft answer. This is a soft and gentle, thoughtful answer. It turns away wrath and anger. Sometimes people can be angry. They can be, you know, aggressive in how they're approaching someone. But if we could just be calm and have a gentle, thoughtful answer or response, sometimes it calms the other person down. This is how you see uh, an argument or a dispute begin to escalate because when one becomes and approaches in a in a manner that is uh, triggering to the other person and they respond in that manner, then they get louder and they get more um, angry and the response on both sides begins to escalate into an argument, into a fight, into something um, that are that where they're spewing out words that they can't bring back, they can't take back. Um, so they've hurt feelings, they've caused pain, they can cause destruction, it can cause division, it can cause uh, unreconcilable um, situations between in families or, or friends or coworkers. And so a soft answer is taking our time and being gentle and thoughtful before we open our mouth because the Amplified says a soft and gentle and thoughtful answer turns away wrath, but harsh and painful and careless words stir up anger. As believers, we're not to stir up strife or cause confusion or um, be argumentative, but we are supposed to operate in love and be peaceable among all men as much as possible. So we need to be careful in choosing our words or even if we should respond at all. But surely if we do, we respond with a soft, gentle, thoughtful answer. Now, still in Proverbs 15, we'll go down to verse 23. Verse 23, same chapter. Proverbs 15, verse 23, the New King James Version says, A man has joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. So here, a man has joy by the answer of his mouth. When we look at the Amplified, it says a man has joy in giving an appropriate answer. And how good and delightful is a word spoken at the right moment, how good it is. So you can have joy in giving an appropriate answer. So again, this is all about us taking time to be slow to speak, to give a correct response, one that's going to glorify God, one that's going to give us peace, one that's going to settle down where there's anger or wrath, one that is going to be thoughtful and gentle, one that can bring peace where there's discord. Um, the NLT here says everyone enjoys a fitting reply. It is wonderful to say the right thing at the right time. So again, when we are slow to speak, when we're careful about our response, our reaction and our answer, this gives an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to guide us, for the word to come to our remembrance so that it's not us operating in the flesh or with a carnal mind or fleshly mouth, right? But it is us being led by the spirit of God to speak peaceably, to be peaceably, and to act peaceably, overcoming evil with good, having an answer that is profitable, that is beneficial, that is calming. Um, and so now we're still in the same chapter. You look down at verse 28, still in Proverbs 15, but verse 28, still looking at the New King James first, and it reads, the heart of the righteous studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. Did you get that? The heart of the righteous studies how to answer. So the Amplified says the heart of the righteous thinks carefully about how to answer in a wise and appropriate and timely way. But the babbling mouth of the wicked pours out malevolent things. So now. 
When you are in right standing with God, abiding in Christ, led by the spirit, the heart of the righteous, those in right standing with God, we want to please God. So we are to think carefully about how we should answer something in a wise way, in the wisdom of God. Sometimes even speaking the word of God, we can respond by it is written. Well, this is what God's word says about it. But even if it's not that it should align with God's word. It should be something spirit filled. It should be something word related, meaning that it is in line with what God would have us to answer. And so when we are in right standing with God, the heart of the righteous thinks carefully. We take our time so that we are speaking words of wisdom. So it's appropriate for the situation, for that time, um, for that circumstance. But a babbling mouth, it says, out of the babbling mouth, there's there's wicked poured out. There's evil that's poured out. Evil things blurts out evil. When we look at the NLT, the New Living Translation, this same verse of scripture says, the heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking. The mouth of the wicked overflows with evil words. There's no time taken. It's just, and we know out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the wicked have wickedness and evil in their heart. That's what comes out of their mouth. So they don't even think about it. They just spew it out. They just babble it out, blurt it out without any thought of consequence or how it's affecting those that are hearing it. And so again, this is the godly, the one that is right with God, thinks about how to answer. How often do you think about how to respond and answer? Even in text messages, in um, in emails, phone calls, face-to-face -face conversations, meetings um, with family, with loved ones, strangers, even enemies, those that oppose us. Do we take time to think about and study or, you know, think about how our answer is going to affect all the hearers? What is the goal? What am I aiming for? What type of, uh, of, of ending am I looking for? Um, and am I thinking about how my response or my reaction or my answer is going to affect the goal that I have, the expectation, what I want to get out of this? Do I want to end up in an argument? Do I want to end up in a debate? Do I want to uh, hurt somebody with my response? Do I want to tear somebody down and hurt their feelings and cause them to, to uh, be devastated? Am I trying to start an argument, strife, confusion? Because these things are opposed to God. But if we're in right standing with him, we're desiring to please God, to glorify him, to minister grace to the hearers, to edify, to build up, to speak words of truth. Um, even if it's an, in the workplace about how you're being talked to um, by an employer, you know, how do you respond? Do you, do you, uh, you know, respond in an angry manner? Do you, or do you have a soft answer? Do you think about it? Is it gentle? Is it going to be productive? Is it going to be beneficial? Is it going to bear good fruit? Um, let's look at um, the next verse of scripture that we're going to look at is in Proverbs chapter 26. This one oftentimes people look at and think is contradicting. Um, each verse is contradicting the other. We're looking at Proverbs 26 verses 4 and 5. And at first glance, it does seem like it's, you know, a contradiction and people are just like, what, you know, am I supposed to do this or am I not supposed to do this? Proverbs 26 verses 4 and 5. New King James Version. It says, do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. Then in verse five, it says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So verse four says, do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you'll be like him. Verse five says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So now, how is this telling me that I should answer a fool according to his folly? I should not answer a fool according to his folly. Which one is it? Is it contradicting? And so, no, it's not. And I want to give us an example um, because when you're talking about answering a fool according to his folly, when you're um, thinking about um, this is the Amplified, it says, do not answer nor pretend to agree with 
the frivolous comments of a close-minded fool according to his folly. Otherwise, you, even you, will be like him. Verse 5, amplified, answer and correct the erroneous concepts of a fool according to his folly. Otherwise, he will be wise in his own eyes if he thinks you agree with him. So it's saying don't answer or pretend or agree with frivolous comments of a closed-minded fool according to his folly. Don't do that. Don't pretend to agree with, don't answer in that manner. Um, but answer and correct or answer, there is a way to answer. So you don't answer um, in the way they present it. A fool will often present a crazy, um, uh, they will present something that is foolish. And then if we're not walking in the spirit, if we're not um, focused on uh, the spiritual things, if we are not focused on um, walking in the wisdom of God, we can answer that fool and become like him. Now, I want to look at an example in Mark chapter 12. Jesus is always our example. And oftentimes people ask Jesus questions and he didn't answer their question with an answer. Oftentimes you will see that Jesus answers a question with a question or he doesn't answer the question. And what this shows us is that, first of all, everything doesn't require a response. But if it's a foolish question or something stated that is foolish, the response or reaction is not a direct answer to that question, but something that simply points out the foolishness <laughs> of what was said. So here's an example. In Mark chapter 12, let me get there. And this is just one example uh, of the many times that Jesus has shown us this. Um, but oftentimes what you say is not even a direct answer or a response to what someone has questioned or something someone has said, but it's something pointing out either the ridiculousness of it or their wicked intents and even bringing it up in the first place. So in Mark chapter 12, we're going to look at verses 19 through 25. I'm not going to go through um, the rest of this, but I do encourage you to, you know, read around this in your own study time. Actually, I'm going to start in verse 18. Um, in verse 18, New King James Version, Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 18. And it says, then some Sadducees who say there's no resurrection came to him and they asked him. They're asking Jesus now. And oftentimes the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they're just trying to provoke Jesus, trying to set him up, trying to trap him, trying to see what he's going to say. But um, they say, teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind, and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and dying, he left no offspring. And the second took her, and he died. Nor did he leave any offspring, and the third likewise. So the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. So now, the tradition uh, is to, you know, you a man marries a wife. He dies, she doesn't have a child, so the brother marries her to have a child. And they're saying, there's seven brothers. They all had the same wife. They all died. None of them had children. Then she died. So here's their question. It says in verse 23, therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as a wife. So now, Jesus does not tell them. The seventh one, because he was the last one. Or the first one, because she was his first. Oftentimes, this is what happens. And even in the body of Christ, that we're so you know, eager to give an answer that 
we don't study the answer. We don't take our time. We're not slow to speak. We're not praying about it. We're not seeking, um, but just answering questions. And oftentimes it's people that are either really seeking the truth or somebody who's trying to trap you up and say, you know, the word is contradicting itself or you don't know what you believe or, you know, trying to see what type of response or reaction they can get out of you. Even if it's trying to anger you, trying to, to see if they can stir you up. Oftentimes there's no reason for a response or the response. So the answer needs to be something that is not directly answering their question, but showing the foolishness of it or the ignorance of it. So this, um, as we read um, in verse 24, Jesus answered and said to them, are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. He never answered their question. He just let them know that they erred they don't know the scriptures or the power of God. And what they said, they were mistaken. Here's what the scriptures say. And so he never directly gave them an answer for their question because there was no answer for it. So we need to be careful that we note the difference between things we need to respond to and give an answer to. Things that we don't need to answer because even when Jesus was being accused and Pilate said, don't you hear them accusing you? And the word says that Jesus didn't, he didn't answer a word. He didn't say a word and it astonished them. Sometimes we need to be quiet. Sometimes we need to um, respond in a manner that is not a direct answer, but simply letting someone know that what they asked or what they said is foolish. It's an error. It's a mistake. It doesn't make sense. Or um, when when they came to Jesus trying to accuse the woman that was caught in adultery, they had caught her in adultery, brought her to Jesus and wanted to know about stoning her. Right. Um, and Jesus, it says he like bent down like he was writing on the ground, writing in the sand. And finally, when he answers he says, he who is without sin cast the first stone. He did not answer their question. And so we need to be slow. We need to be intentional. We need to be gentle. We need to have a soft answer. We're representing the spiritual kingdom of God. We're representing Christ Jesus. And so as believers, we have to let no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouth. We have to make sure that we are not lying, but speaking the truth. Um, we have to have a soft answer, a gentle answer, a thoughtful answer, and we need to study our answers. So stay in the word, meditate on the truth, and allow the Holy Spirit to guide you and lead you in your response and in your answers. We're going to close in prayer. Don't forget, you can join us Monday through Friday at 5.45 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on my Facebook Live and my Instagram Live for the Master's Class. It's not my class. It's not a master class. It is the master's class. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we honor you. Thank you for your word, Father. Help us to be gentle, to be kind, to be slow to speak. Help us, Lord God, Father, that every answer and every response is to glorify you and led by your spirit and is aligned with your word. So we yield ourselves to you. Have your way and continue to purge and prune us. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Love you to life. I will see you on our next sit-ups. The word that did it for me. When you want inner healing and you want a sound mind, peace of mind, life application of God's word is the answer. I encourage you get spiritual help from mental health and learn to apply God's word daily and receive his healing.